Welcome to Health System CIO's interview with Rebecca Kennis, CISO with R Not Health. I'm Anthony Guerra, founder and editor in chief. Rebecca, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. All right, very good. Let's start off. Um, tell me a little bit about your organization and your role. Sure. So R Not Health is um, it's a small to medium sized healthcare organization. Uh, located in the, the southern tier of New York and very northern tier of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, we have three small hospitals. Uh, we have a skilled nursing facility. We have some uh, graduate medical education and um, uh, around 50 or so um, primary and specialty care practices throughout the region. Would you uh, describe, and I'm not too familiar with that specific area, would you describe it as rural or not quite? Parts of it are very rural, yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah, it's it's most, I guess you could definitely classify it as rural. Okay, very good. So there, there'll be uh, some issues we'll touch on there that are sort of specific to smaller rural facilities that are having significant challenges around cyber um, that we've heard about recently. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to start with sort of an open-ended question. And just ask you sort of what's on your mind. What are the either the main things you're working on, looking at, thinking about that type of a thing? We'll go from there. Yeah. So the the biggest thing that I have on my mind right now is building up our culture of security at at Arnett. Um, we, you know, we're we're any healthcare organization um, has all of the issues that they've got going on. You know, they're trying to. Um, trying to maintain the the proper nursing ratios, they've got you know all kinds of issues with um, with all of that. So the last thing that they necessarily have on their minds are you know how are they going to um, protect the data that they have. So it's it's my job and my team's job to make sure that 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 is something that's um, forefront of their minds. Mm -hmm. So. And the way that we're looking to do that is to really build up the culture of security, make sure that it becomes part of the culture itself of the organization and not just something that they need to check off a box or, um, you know, some regulation that that we need to meet, you know, another regulation that we need to meet. It really needs to be um, kind of an all hands on deck with security, uh, particularly of late with all of the, the ransomware attacks that are happening. Um, the, the staff are really the front line of the organization. And, you know, no matter how many security technical controls that we put in place, it takes one person to click on the wrong thing and we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we're doing a lot of work on trying to build up that culture of security. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I did a webinar the other day and, uh, you know, some very passionate comments about how, you know, security, everyone's got to change their thinking about security. It's not an add on. It's not a bolt on. It's not a, a pain in the butt to deal with. It is fundamental to everything. Um, and one of the ways that, that people are trying to get that across is, and it's not, it's genuine, it's honest, it's, you cannot practice the care that you want to practice that we're supposed to be practicing without the tools, the the software tools that you use. You can't. You can't tell a carpenter to go build a house without their tools, right? So these I... days you cannot tell a clinician to go practice healthcare without their software tools. And therefore you're asking them you're telling them that if you don't do these security things, if you don't follow these protocols, if you don't do these things, you won't have those tools. So you're related to patient safety in that sense. Does that all sound right to you as sort of the fundamental absolutely. messaging? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the first thing that I do um, when I'm talking with, you know, a new set of employees, when, you know, when we're introducing this to um, any group at all is really to make sure that they're understanding the why. Because if they don't understand the why, they're never going to hear the what. So, you know, 
with security, of course, it's, you know, there's the, the CIA triad. You have the, the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the data. And typically, you know, when you're thinking of security, you're thinking about, you know, trying to protect the confidentiality of it. But uh, if, you know, if you don't have the, if you don't have a good sense of the integrity of the data and the availability of it, absolutely, you're going to have patient issues, you're going to have medical errors, um, you know, all kinds of other things that, you know, that bad that could happen with that. So that's really kind of the first place that I start is making sure that they're connecting those dots to um, this is, this is why this is so important. And this is why we need to be putting in some of these controls that maybe they're not going to like, or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, of, of course, you know, we would much rather have it so that, you know, everybody can just kind of go in and do whatever you want, but that's not realistic in, in the environment that we're in. So uh, we need to, to try to find that, that happy place in between to where they can still do their jobs, where it's not going to um, prevent them from treating their patients and treating them quickly when they have to, but also making sure that, you know, everybody else can't get in there and and have access to the data and either um, steal the data or corrupt it or you know otherwise make it not available so it's you know there's there's that dance that you have to play yeah i would just thought of the analogy of a seat belt you know in a car you're about to drive a car you put the seat belt on now when people started having to be required to wear seat belts especially older folks I don't know if my father ever put on a seatbelt in his life when he was alive, <laughs> because yeah. but but we changed all that right, and it became part of driving. It's just part of driving. You put your seatbelt on. You don't go, oh God, I have to put my seatbelt. It's going to slow me down, right? So this is where security has to get to. It is fundamentally part of the driving, which is being on the computer. That's the driving. You got to put your seatbelt on. It's not something to complain about because it's just part of it, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and there's ways that, you know, us as security professionals can make that transition easier. Um, you know, you try to reduce the, the friction in, in their work. Um, you know, obviously, you try to make sure that they understand it. And one thing that, that I'm, you know, I try very hard at is just not using the word no. Uh, you want to, you know, when they, they come and they say, you know, we want to do this, you, you know, even though your first instinct might be to say, no, are you, are you crazy? Right. <laughs> um, you, you really want to say, okay, well, you know, let's look at that. Let's talk about this. And usually you're going to end up with, um, you know, a way that, that they can still accomplish what they want to accomplish, but maybe it's not as risky as what, they initially had proposed. And, and that's really what you need to do is that you need to make those you know, risk-based decisions. So you, you kind of look at, you know, what are, what's the end goal? What do you want to get to? And how much risk is the organization willing to take in, in doing that? And you're going to kind of find that, that place in between those extremes. Because usually usually those extremes neither one of those extremes is the best choice of course there's exceptions to some of things but you know usually you're not going to go to either one of those extremes and when we talk about the individual ultimately making that decision you know let's say there's a uh, a request and you're saying well you know there's other ways we can do this i'm not super comfortable with the exact way you want to do it I'd like to do it this way. I think you'll get the similar result to what you want. Perhaps the individual is, no, I want it this way. And the tiebreaker is who? The CEO? I mean, or or a governance committee, or it depends on the situation. Ultimately, again, you're not making that decision. You're not deciding the level of risk. The organ You're articulating it, theoretically. Mm -hmm. You're describing it to someone in the business or operations position, who will then make that decision between your point of view and the requester's point of view and say, here's what we're going to do. This is the risk we're going to accept or not accept, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, there it comes down to that they're business decisions. So I make my recommendations based on the scenario, based on the risks that are 
um, that are presented to the organization by doing this. And then it becomes up to the business owner to say, you know, yes, I'm willing to accept this risk and here's why, or no, I guess I'm not willing to accept this risk and we're gonna find a different solution for it. So, um, you know, the security, it, it, you know, it's the same thing with IT in general too. So security and IT really cannot be driving the business on this. You know, you need to, the business needs to be driving it and then we support them in what it is that they want and need to do and try to find the best ways that that is going to be, you know, in the best case for the organization. Uh, so what you're talking about, it's sort of a, you're here and the business owner, the requesters here, you're describing the risk to them. They're deciding whether or not they want to accept it. I'm wondering if you also have scenarios where someone up here has oh, to make absolutely. that decision. Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, you're, you're always going to have the, the case where, um, you know, somebody is going to be presenting to, you know, a, a scenario to you and you say, you know, look, these are the risks that are, that are going. And if it's something that, you know, you feel strongly that this is really putting the, a risk to the organization, it's going to need to be escalated to somebody that is, you know, higher in the food chain, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. You know, yeah. either um, a compliance committee or some other governance committee or, you know, depending on the issue directly up to, you know, the, the CFO, the CEO, somebody that is, um, you know, really the buck stops with them as mm -hmm. far as those types of decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned bring when, when folks are coming in, trying to get them to understand security, where you're coming from, new folks, that type of thing. Are you finding that people are are more understanding of um, the importance of cybersecurity, just maybe from reading about ransomware incidents and places shutting down, or perhaps from their personal lives, they've had identity theft, or they've heard of identity theft, or a family member. Do you think it's getting easier, or is it kind of where it was, and it's still a, a big learning curve? Well, I mean, it, it is a big learning curve, but it is. I think it is getting better. You know, it and it's all in how it's presented to them. So. If they see, if they hear examples, if they, you know, get to understand that why, it gets back to the why. So, and then if they can also kind of have that parallel into their own lives, mm -hmm. say, you know, you would not, you would not want your bank account, you know, your money. Would you, would you be, you know, willing to have that open wide for anybody to have access to it? And, you know, you kind of make those parallels to it. You know, people don't, when you're, when you're in your private life and your bank is requiring a, a multi-factor authentication or some other thing, you're not fighting against the bank no. and say, you know, you just, you just do it. And you know, really, yeah. even though some of them are, you know, they feel like a nuisance, you just know, you know, you want your, that's your money. You want it protected. It's really no different here. Although it, it's actually a little bit stronger of a reason, you know, these patients are coming to us and they are trusting us that we are going to keep their information confidential, that we're going to keep it safe and secure, and that we are going to do everything that we can do to protect it and them ultimately. So it's, it's our duty really to be able to do whatever we can to protect them. So it, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more like you see some aha moments, you know, just to steal from Oprah, I guess, you know, when you're, when you're starting to explain some of these things to them and how certain things are, um, pre present risk and, um, could potentially be seen as something that could expose a patient to, um, to harm. You know, you kind of see those light bulbs go off in their head. Like, oh, I never really thought about it like that. You know, healthcare workers ultimately, they they went into healthcare because they want to help. You know, they want to they want to be helpful people. So even something as simple as, you know, a, a staff member walking into a secured area and holding the door open for somebody that's mm -hmm. coming behind them with like, you know, an armful of stuff. They don't really think 
well, maybe that person with an armful of stuff really shouldn't be in there in the first place. And they're using that as, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as, um, as a means for somebody to, you know, be the nice guy and let them in. So you have to, you know, I, I hate to, I hate to say this, but you know, they have to have a little bit of suspicion in, in any time they're in those scenarios and, you know, think twice about it. You know, you know, think before you click on any emails, think before you're doing um, anything that is out of the ordinary. Um, and, you know, in these, and these things need to be presented to them, not just once a year, when it's time to do the, the annual required trainings, that needs to be throughout the year. You know, you can't just have the once and done with security and expect anybody to retain any of it and have that build any culture of security in the organization. That needs to be happening throughout the year, whether it's through, you know, monthly short trainings, whether it's through um, newsletters that you're sending out, whether it's through some other types of engagement that you have with the staff, it needs to be something that's an ongoing thing to keep it top of mind for them. And then it just becomes part of the culture. It's part of what they do. It's, you know, putting your seatbelt on when you get in the car, just because that's your habit now. So you want them to not have to think about, oh, what was it that I learned about this? You want it just to become second nature. And, and then, you know, if the security team does not end up becoming someone that you have to work around, but someone that you can work with and someone that you can trust and, you know, all of that. Well, that's excellent. Um, yeah, you want to make it second nature. Another term is muscle memory. You know, people use things like that. Um, you know, you, you had an interesting example of holding the door. Um, and I'm not sure if you were thinking of that in the sense of just um, an author, unauthorized person gaining access. Or are you thinking of it, them gaining access and then engaging with a computer? So it's like almost where the physical meets the cyber, right? Yeah. And perhaps someone didn't log out. Uh, it gets into a rather complex scenario of someone physically gaining access to then gain access to a computer. But I guess it could happen. I mean, so Absolutely. you're concerned about that too as a CISO. You're concerned not only about logins and and um, clicking on things and all that, but you want you that also bleeds over for you. And I'm you tell me into the physical realm. Absolutely right. So with information security, there's you know three different types of controls. You have the um, the technical controls that you know everyone's thinking about. You know you're you know you're putting in the firewalls and you know, all of that to protect the perimeters and, you know, and all of that. There's also the administrative controls, meaning you have the policy the procedures, you're training people, you're, you know, doing all of your risk assessments, everything in there. And then there's the physical controls. You want to make sure that, um, that data isn't, you know, lying out on a desk somewhere where someone's going to see it, that you're not having um, people that, that don't have access or shouldn't have access to certain areas, have access to it because they could see things inadvertently or on purpose that they don't want to see. It also gives people access to, you know, maybe potentially the, the servers, potentially to, you know, something, you know, any ports that might be open. You know, that's also part of the physical security as well. So there's all kinds of aspects that, again, you know, most people, when you're thinking about information security, you're not thinking about these these physical aspects. So, you know, we have to work very closely with our public safety area to make sure that, um, you know, that they're thinking about all of that as well. You know, they're thinking about, you know, trying to keep, keep people safe from, you know, fire and theft and, and, and all of that, you know, in the um, unruly patients and visitors. But there's this other piece as well. You know, you want to make sure that that there's not easy access to data that people shouldn't have access to. Two other things come to mind. You tell me if if these enter your world. One is when you see passwords on post-it notes on people's oh. minds. <laughs> so, so let's take the, let me mention these two and then you can take them one at a time. Passwords on post-it notes. And then I, I wonder if every person has experienced this. I would guess so. You're in a, you're a patient or perhaps, you know, even someone like yourself at 
walking around the health system or one of the hospitals or whatever. And you hear this talk, you hear, you're in, I've been in a patient room where I could hear caregivers at a nurse station or something talking about a patient, all kinds of things I probably should not be hearing. Do those enter the CISO's mind, those kind of things? They absolutely, they do. I mean, certain things like, you know, having the rooms like right next to each other and hearing that, the, there has, to, again, you can't have everything to the extreme. Right. Because otherwise, you know, the, what you would have to put into place to prevent that, to mitigate that, mm -hmm. would be, it would get into the unreasonable right. way. You know, right. And no hospital system would, or healthcare system would be able to afford that. So, you know, by putting all of the um, soundproofing and all yeah. that, what you have to do is you have to, you know, you put in mitigating um, controls in place so that you tell people, you know, you, you train them to understand, don't have these conversations out in public areas. You know, you don't want to, um, you know, don't put your sticky notes on the, I mean, never, <laughs> never do that. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's it's still, it still gives me when you when you see that. Um, uh -huh. it's, it's getting less, but, um, but yeah, that, that does still happen from time to time. But what we really want to do as well is that with the, with building up that culture of security, you know, we're a relatively small team. We're mm -hmm. not everywhere. When you build up that culture of security, you then have eyes and ears all around. Yeah. So that you have it where the staff are comfortable enough to have a conversation and say, hey, you really shouldn't be having that password on the sticky note. You know, that that needs to be that needs to be gone. That's not okay. You know, you, know, you shouldn't, I heard you, you know, I hear you're having this conversation in an elevator about these people mm -hmm. you really shouldn't be doing that you know so you want to kind of build it up to where it's you know they're having a little bit of those uncomfortable conversations but it becomes the norm versus you know just that just some people may be doing it because they're the ones that are you know the rule followers and all of that you know i mean you want yeah. you want that to become part of the culture of the organization Right. So we talked about some of this stuff. Um, the real, and from what I understand, and we did a webinar on this yesterday on, on email, that's the number one attack vector. Um, and, and it's the most important method of communication, right? Mm -hmm. So of legitimate communication, emails, legitimate emails must be received properly. They can't, they can't be just rejected. They can't go into spam folder unless people understand they need to start checking their spam folder. If you're tightening up the controls and things are going to be going into spam more. There's, we had a whole discussion about this yesterday. Really interesting. Um, but this is the number one attack vector. When we talk about cyber hygiene and, and a, a culture of security, my guess is in addition to the things we talked, that's the number one thing. Don't download an attachment and don't click on a link, right? Absolutely. So, Right. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me about that. And, and if you want to touch on the idea of you can't over tighten that knob because the legitimate stuff has to get through. Right. Well, and you can't. And, and I saw um, a statistic yesterday that said that, you know, seven to 10 percent of um, of emails get through. Like there's a seven, seven to 10 percent failure rate on any of those email filters. So you really need to, and if you so extrapolate let me, out that let me say, so, so three, three out of 10, like three malicious emails will get through out of 10. Is that what you're saying? No, it's a seven to 10% failure rate. So seven, seven to 10 out of a hundred. Okay. okay. So, right. So if you, so if you say that even just taking the seven, so seven out of 100 emails, how many emails come through the health system daily? thousands mm -hmm. so you have I mean, you could have like hundreds of of um phishing emails that are coming through in any one organization at a time so you really need to rely on uh, the staff to be able to to recognize what's a phishing email and i, I mean and i'll say with you know with, with chat gpt and those other um, tools that are out now, you know, they're, they're great tools that can do a lot of good, 
but it's also making it so much easier for the bad actors to create their um, their phishing emails. Mm -hmm. They're making them much more um, realistic. They're making them, you know, removing a lot of those telltale signs that you might have seen before with the, you know, the bad grammar and the, you know, all of that, that, you know, that was kind of one of the first things you would always look for. Mm -hmm. So what you really need to do then is you need to move it to, okay, well, more generically, what am I looking for? Well, first thing was this, is this an unexpected email? You know, were you expecting to get a message from the CEO to say, go and buy me some gift cards because I need to do this? And, you know, so is that an expected thing? Second thing, the urgency in it. There's always urgency in, in a phishing email because they don't want you to think about it too much. They, you know, this is something that you need to do and you need to take care of it quickly. So, you know, we need this information. Click on this link, download this thing, fill this out, send this information back to us, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and, and third thing, is there a link or are they asking for any of that information? So you kind of put those in, and any one of those in and of itself might be enough to make you say, okay, let's stop and think. If you get all three of them, mm -hmm. be highly suspicious of that email. Right. So, so you, you know, you really need to, um, you know, to kind of take those and make sure that that staff are comfortable with with assessing that and that they're taking the time to stop and read those as if, you know, any email could be um, could be a, a suspicious link or a, a, a phishing email. Yeah, super important. I, they even said yesterday that so this one organization, they have, uh, I guess it goes into a quarantine folder and twice a day people get a report or an email that lists the emails that are in their quarantine. They have to review them. Right. And apparently even on occasion, people are releasing uh, malicious emails from the quarantine folder by accident. So <laughs> we, we've quarantined it. So we want you to take a special look at this stuff and they still occasionally make mistakes. Does that shock right. you? Yeah. Uh no. no, I mean, because they're people. I mean, yeah. Anytime yeah. you're relying on on humans, yeah, humans make errors. You you know you you want to have those technical controls in a place mm -hmm. to to reduce the the risk and to reduce the number of times that humans need to make those critical decisions. But there's you know there's still going to there's still going to be errors. The, you kind of have to expect it. And that's why, you know, you kind of, why there's now, you know, it's not if it ends up happening, yeah. but when. So it's, you know, you do all you can to prevent things right. and to give people information. Um, but ultimately there's a lot of, there's a lot of finger crossing and hoping that people recognize it. And then if they recognize it, that they recognize it quickly and that they can trust you to report it. Right. So you know, the one the one thing that I, I always make sure that I tell, um, you know, the the new employees that come in, is that if you click on something, if something happens, you know, and you're like, oh, geez, I should not have done that. <laughs> let us know right away. You will not get in trouble for for doing that if you let us know right away. If you don't, if you try to pretend like it didn't happen. <laughs> We can't promise you will not get in trouble for that. <laughs> I, you're so, absolutely right because yeah. I've said, I've admitted that my reaction, if I clicked on something and got some sort of ransomware screen, screen, I'd probably close my computer and run to lunch and just hope that it all went away. Yeah. But that's absolutely right. the wrong response. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Because, right. Because the sooner that we can try to, to react to yeah. what happened, you can at least minimize it and yeah. potentially prevent something. So, yeah, so you, you definitely need to make sure first, you know, you want to make sure that they have the information, the education to, to try to prevent them from clicking on something. But if they do, you want to make sure that they are, that they have that trust in you Yeah. that, that they can reach out and say, Hey, I made this, this mistake. And you know, I'm sorry, I made this mistake so that we can then t go and Ooh. try to mitigate the the outcome. You're so right. And that's got to be done ahead of time. 
That messaging yeah. that you're not going to get in trouble has to be ahead of time so that they That's don't have that panic moment that I mentioned and run to lunch and say, maybe it'll all go away. Um, whatever. So that's, that's great, great messaging. And, and again, uh, that's, that's all part of that culture of security. Yeah. It's, it's that full message of, you know, security is kind of woven into all the business and the operations of what we're doing. You know, it shouldn't be an afterthought. You right. should trust us. You know, we're, we're your team, mem team members. So it's, you know, you don't want to think of us as just the security people that are, you know, off in the basement and they're watching what we're doing and they're, you know, they're going to get us in trouble and they're going to prevent us from doing our work. We want to make sure that that, that is integrated in the yeah. full culture of the organization that, um, you know, we're not trying to make it difficult for them. No. We're trying to make it easier to do and and to prevent issues from from coming down a hundred percent a hundred percent and i gotta let you go soon but and you you have to think through as a security professional you have to think through from the emails coming in we've put in our tools to to sort of prevent the malicious ones from coming in seven out of ten of them are going to get through right out of a hundred some you know seven to ten out of a hundred are going to get through We've done our culture teaching. We've done everything possible. People are still going to click. It's going to happen at some point. Someone's going to click on a malicious link or download a malicious attachment. What are we going to do on our end? What are we going to do? Hopefully they tell us, but perhaps they don't. What are we going to do? How do we find out about it? What tools do we have to be to find out about it? If they don't tell us, we still hopefully technically can find get some notification. And then what do we do to stop it, um, isolate it? And worse comes to worse, we have some sort of ransomware event. What do we do? What's our business continuity plan, right? I mean, your job is to think through that whole scenario as it unfolds in a negative sense. And if everything kind of goes wrong, you have to be ready, right? I mean, that's the job. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's there's the piece that um, the security team and um, IT need to own on all of that. But then the business continuity plan, that's the operations. So that they need to be pulled in on that. And there needs to be a full organizational plan, particularly for something like ransomware. You know, there are some things that, you know, it, it would be contained to, to security and IT. But anything that is beyond anything localized that can't be mitigated quickly and thoroughly, the full organization needs to have representation and involvement in that. So, um, and, and then it needs to be practiced regularly so that, you know, it's not, um, it's not something that, you know, you're, you're seeing the first time when, when it counts, you know, kind of like a fire drill. You want to make sure that, you know, everybody knows how to get out of the building and where are you meeting and, you know, all of that. It's the same thing with this is that, you everybody has to know okay this is my role this is your role mm -hmm. this is what we need to do in this order and then you know it needs to be written down because when you're in those urgent um scenarios you don't want to rely on your memory mm -mm. And, and and all of that particularly when there's multiple people in multiple um areas uh, so you want to make sure that there's a written plan that there's written um instructions for how to do it and it's been practiced mm -hmm. you know at least once or twice so yeah. um, you know and practice regularly yep. excellent rebecca we're about out of time i just want to give you an opportunity for a final thought final best piece of advice for someone in your position at a comparable sized health system what's your best piece of advice my best piece of advice is really to to work on that culture of security um, it, it's something that, you know, anybody that talks to me at Arna, is, you know, they're going to keep hearing over and over and over. Build that rapport with the peers, with um, with leadership, with staff. Uh, make sure that they feel comfortable, that that they're um, that they that they can come to you, that they trust you, and that they are getting regular training, year, you know, in awareness, you know, throughout the year, not just once. 
Great stuff, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. This was this was great. I absolutely enjoyed it.